Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Seper. I'm from DDD Iran. Tonight, uh, we are really glad to uh, meet Stefan Hoffer, uh, which um, is an author and um, an active speaker in DDD community. Um, we have also Maria, uh, which will help us uh, tonight uh, as an ex and as, as as a domain expert. Uh, so thanks to uh, these two people who will animate uh, our web, our web, uh, webinar tonight. So I will let you, Stefan, uh, start your pr presentation, and thank you again. Thank you and salam, DDD Iran. Man Stefan Hastam, and that's all the Farsi I'm going to talk tonight because it's not good enough to give this talk um, in Farsi, so I will stick to English. Um, I'm talking uh, with you from, from Hamburg in Germany, even though originally I'm uh, from Austria, but I've been living and working at a company called Workplace Solutions uh, here in Hamburg for the last 15 years. We develop software, we coach and consult, and I myself have a background as software developer. Um, but in the last couple of years, my focus really has switched towards um, requirements and towards um, domain-driven design. And domain storytelling is kind of in the middle um, of those two topics. So A situation that um, I guess most of you know is that when we want to build software, especially business software, we, the software experts, we speak our um, technical jargon and the domain experts, well, they speak their business language. Even if we speak the same natural language like Farsi or English or Spanish, um, still we often don't understand each other. And that's of course a problem. And one big, big thing in DDD and actually in all of software development is we have to reach um, a state, we have to bridge this gap where we as the software experts are able to talk with the domain experts about their problem, about their needs in their own language so we can really understand them. So, but how do we reach that? Well, um, in the DDD community, we have come up with this term of collaborative modeling meaning we get people from all departments in all roles, get them together, well, ideally in a room in front of a whiteboard, but also now in the digital world, um, remote on digital whiteboards like Nero, for example, and we have to talk to each other. And there are several techniques that enable such conversations about the domain, about requirements, about business needs, about problems. One of those techniques is, of course, event storming, and another one is domain storytelling. And that's um, the technique I'm going to talk about tonight. I did not invent domain storytelling, um, but I gave it its name. And together with my colleague Henning, who can see here on the screen in this picture, um, we're also writing a book about it and um, giving talks about it. So why domain storytelling? Um, what can it be used for? Well, most basically, we can use it um, to reach a common understanding, like I said before, between business and IT. And that's the use case that we're going to look at tonight in our short demo. But of course, there's more. So we can use it to find bounded contexts or service boundaries, for example, for microservices. We can use it to think about um, a domain model, designing a domain model. We can use it for working with requirements, for designing workflows, new processes, and I will briefly go into these topics uh, towards the end of my talk, where I present some real world examples. So that's the schedule for today. I think it's really best to understand what domain storytelling is if you actually see it. So that's why I'm uh, very happy that Mariam uh, and I can do this demo. And after you saw it, I will explain a method to you. So then you understand how it works. Then I will show you a couple of real world examples. And finally, I'm happy to answer all your questions. Okay, Mariam, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, then I will switch my um, screen to 
a different window, which you should be able to see now. Mariam, you see it? Yeah, I have it. Uh, actually, I'm ready to get down to it and figure out what the domain source holding is really about in practice. Yeah, yeah I'm all with you. Okay. So, of course, uh, for obvious reasons, we cannot be in a room together. We cannot stand in front of a whiteboard together. So this is our whiteboard for today, a little modeling tool. More on the tool later. This really isn't about a tool. You can use it with Miro or with, with a real whiteboard, whatever. So don't focus too much on the tool. Um, it's just a means to an end. Okay. I already know that Mariam um, has a story to tell about a travel agency, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what are we going to model? What process are we going to look at? Okay. If you agree, we can start by looking at how a travel agency works in a reservation mm -hmm. scenario. Because uh, okay. I think uh, it seems everyone is a little bit familiar with it and we can have a shared understanding of that. So as you know, the travel agency is ultimately responsible for helping travelers to select best services. And uh, typically its customers can be divided into two major groups, business and leisure travelers. Okay. Yeah, and ideally the business travelers does not care about pricing that much because their company pays for that and follows registration workflows. On mm -hmm. the other hand, the leisure travelers are um, often price sensitive and are interested in hotel packages, discounts and offers. So um, as long as they have different wants and needs, I think mm -hmm. it would be better to review their travel booking scenarios separately. Therefore, exactly. now my primary focus is around leisure traveler and travel agent as our main personas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So and, that's uh, very good. So we start with one specific example, a leisure traveler, not a business traveler. Mm -hmm. And then you said you have your travel agent, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I have two personal leisure traveler and travel agent. Uh, and uh, just one important point that uh, my discussion will go through happy path of reservation scenario and I'll intentionally exclude any kind of alternatives or exceptions or branches to keep things clear and precise as much as possible. But you can ask me any if you mm -hmm. need any further information. Okay, that's also great. So that's what we typically start with. Uh, we look at one specific case. Mm -hmm. Often it's the happy path. And from that, we work to the more complicated paths. Okay. okay, so let's start. So what does a leisure traveler have to do uh, when he wants mm -hmm. to make a reservation at the travel agency? Yeah, to begin, I, as a travel agent, works, uh, work on uh, the counter of a travel agency. And usually mm -hmm. the travelers come to me and talk about their itinerary. I mean, they talk about their schedule, budget, and number yeah. of packs. Um, okay, so you said at the counter. Um, yeah. So we are not in an online world, right? We are in a physical world. Yeah, we are um, in the physical world. Then I will world. add this to our scenario, uh, leisure traveler. Okay. So they talk to each other and you said, what do they um, talk about? Yeah, they mainly talk about the traveler schedule, budget and the number of packs. Okay, what is a PAX? Yeah, in, in travel industry, it's a slang for passengers. Okay, I will write a quick comment here. That's my comment. So PAX is person. And since you said they talk with each other, um, I used an icon here that represents a conversation. So they physically talk um, with each other, probably for a mask, of course. But still, they have this conversation. Okay, they talk about the schedule, the budget number, uh, the budget and the number of packs of passengers. And then mm -hmm. what does the travel agent do with that information? Uh, yeah, then uh, the travel agent uh, checks the system for available services and prices. Okay. Um, available services and prices. 
Um, what system does he or she check? Um, does the system yeah. have a name? Uh, it's not a specific system. Usually we can ha use different systems, but it's an online ticketing system that I log into it and check services availability. Yeah, okay. it's exactly online ticketing system. Okay. Now I used a document here, assuming this is some sort of text-based description that you find in this uh, in this online system Some yeah okay yeah it uh, and at this point the system integrates uh, different information from different suppliers such as airlines um, hotels car rental companies and summarize them as a categorized report okay um, so you said it gets information yeah. yeah gets information from suppliers okay actually i will probably change the icon to something less looking like a document i usually take this mm -hmm. info icon when it's like data or information in general so it gets it from other suppliers um since this is the first time we talk about this travel agency i would prefer not to go too much in the, into the technical details, okay. what kind of systems it talks to and what protocols to talk. So for the moment, I would say it's fine for me to say um, suppliers, maybe even several. So it's not just one system, it could be several. Yeah, and exactly. it gets information from them, right? Yeah. And uh, the, when the system gathers all the information, it integrates them as a simple categorized report. Categorized report. I will choose a document icon for that again. Mm -hmm. And um, you said integrates. That information to a categorized report. Okay, now the travel agent has a report about the available mm -hmm. services and prices. Yeah, exactly. And I simply compare the prices uh, since I've mentioned that we are talking about a leisure traveler and this um, persona is a uh, price sensitive. I mm -hmm. compare the prices and select the best suited services to traveler uh, upon their budget. Okay, I add this information that our leisure traveler is price sensitive. Yeah, and, and then I yeah. recommend best suited services to traveler. Okay, so. Yeah, exactly. It's again kind of negotiation. Mm -hmm. And such a service, so that's like a, like a package of different things, like a hotel, yeah. maybe a flight, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, usually the main suppliers are airlines, car rentals, hotels, and uh, other things like that. Yeah, that's also worth a note. So we have airlines, hotels, car rentals, and so on. Okay. Okay, then you recommend, or the travel agent recommends something to the leisure traveler, yeah? Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, at this point, the traveler makes his or her mind and select the preferred ones. Okay, and they do that like immediately or do they take mm -hmm. the, the offer uh, um, with them home or, mm -hmm. or should I... I yeah, as you mentioned, in reality, this case happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. But for now, we can suppose that uh, our, tra our traveler make a decision at that time. Yeah, okay, choose yeah. services. So you choose a particular service. And again, that's a conversation that's happening. Okay. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and after that, I register personal information of traveler and uh, his or her packs in the system again. Okay, so that looks like something that I can show with a document icon. So personal information of passenger and 
packs and that goes into the online ticketing system, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, is it necessary to mention that this personal information includes their identity and context information? Um, we can add that with a note. So we have contact info and some, what is it, identity? Yeah, their identity. Identity, forgive me, it's late. I'm not sure if I'm making many spelling mistakes. It doesn't look right. Okay, if it's wrong, I cannot spot it, sorry. <laughs> no matter, no matter. Yeah, when I enter this information to the system and select the services, the system uh, puts uh, selected services on hold and uh, generates invoice. Okay, so there are at least two things going on yeah. here. So, so basically this personal information is also used to, um, to, you said, put on hold, right? Yeah, I put on hold the services, the selected services. Okay, selected services. So no one else can buy this service, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I understand that. Yeah, so we put it on hold. Okay, and then you said something about an invoice. Yeah, the system generates invoice and notifies me. Okay. And for that invoice, you also need the, the information we had at step seven, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And you are notified about this invoice, so it's not sent to the customer directly or something? No, no, it uh, first notifies me because um, sometimes there's a time lag between the sending request, reservation requests to suppliers and receiving responses, but mm -hmm. it doesn't take too much time usually. Okay, so in general, how much time does it take for this invoice? Uh, at least up to five minutes. You said uh, in a bad case, it could be much longer. Yeah. Then maybe I can do something to make, to separate this notification from the invoice a bit more clear. Maybe I should do it like that. So I have this information I can hear. It in voice node Does that look right? Yeah, it's right. Okay. So okay. now I know that the invoice is ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The invoice is ready. And I asked travelers to pay the whole amount of invoice using our payment terminal. Okay, there's a payment terminal. Um, I will just use another computer icon for that because mm -hmm. I didn't change the, the palette of available icons. So that's your payment terminal. Okay. And now the leisure traveler has to pay that price, pay right? Yeah, pay the price. So that's a credit card icon. So I'm assuming since it's a terminal, it's not a cash payment, it's usually a, a card payment, right? Yeah, right. Wouldn't it, wouldn't and it. after that, the payment terminal sends an acknowledgement to the system. Okay, to the online ticketing system? No, to our system. Yep, yeah, uh, yeah, to, here. To yeah exactly, in our okay. online mm -hmm. ticketing system. I'll make a little room here, so. Again, I will use this info icon for this notification. You said uh, it sends an acknowledgement, right? Yeah. Okay. So then we send an acknowledgement. And now the online ticketing, online ticketing system knows that it's paid for. Why does it need yeah, to exactly. know that? 
because uh, actually um, when the payment due, actually the system generates PNR. And uh, when the PNR registered, we can say that the reservation process is finished. Okay, what's a PNR? Yeah, PNR is the abbreviation form of passenger name record. And uh, it's a digital certificate allowing passengers to do online checking. Okay, so uh, this is generated, right? Yeah, it's generated. Okay, and then yeah. we have this PNR. And yeah, when we have PNR, the system sends the PNR to the passenger email. Okay, so I can either do it as two steps or maybe to make it a bit shorter, I can just add on here an email and say this is now the PNR in form of an email. And that one goes to the traveler. Let's zoom out a little bit. Now it's typical for this kind of workshop that it looks a bit messy at first. Usually it takes a couple of minutes um, after the workshop to clean it up a little bit. So let's add and sense. So the online ticketing, uh, ticketing system generates the um, PNR and uh, sends it as an email to the traveler, right? Yeah, well done. Um, now I can say that um, we can say that the reservation process is finished. Okay, then we can do something very quickly to round it up. Um, can you still read the, the text or is it too small now? To me it's clear, but I'm not sure about other audience okay. or maybe... I will, I will read it out anyway. So what I can do now mm -hmm. is, um, some of the beauties of this little tool, I can actually replay the story step by step or sentence by sentence to check That's if there's anything missing or inconsistent. So what I've understood is that um, the reservation at a travel agency, given that we have a Malaysia traveler who is price sensitive and who comes in person to the travel agency, to the, to the desk. Um, first, he, talk, uh, he talks about the schedule and his budget and the number of packs, the passengers with the travel agent who then checks for available services and prices in an online ticketing system. That ticketing system gets a lot of information from several suppliers like airlines, hotels, car rentals, and so on, and creates a categorized report, which then the travel agent uses to, uh, recommend, uh, to recommend the best suited uh, services to the leisure traveler. So that's something that really the person does, right? So it's not like, uh -huh. uh, here's the best offer and the machine tells you what to do. This is like with the experience of the travel agent, they do that, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Then the leisure traveler chooses um, a particular service and the travel agent then puts the personal information of the passenger and the packs, including the contact info and the identity into the online ticketing system. <laughs> And now I know why that makes sense because uh, um, we said, well, the selected services are put on hold and um, the information then is used to generate an invoice. And here it's noteworthy that you as travel agent to get an invoice notification because it can take uh, up a couple of minutes and maybe you don't see that the invoice is ready because then uh, the traveler still needs to pay the price of the services that he or she chose uh, with a payment terminal. That's also in the, um, uh, in the office, I guess. And then the payment terminal sends an acknowledgement to the online ticketing system. And now we can finally generate the passenger name record, which can be used for online check-in and um, since we already have the contact info from step seven, we can now send an email to the travel uh, to the traveler, and then basically it's done. We have made a reservation, chosen something, paid for it, and now I can take my flight to let's say Shiraz and enjoy the city of gardens and roses. So. 
Did we miss something? Um, no, actually, I have. I think we visualized everything, and I really enjoyed from this pictographic. And I think whatever I've explained now, I have in my screen. Thank cool. you so much. Uh, thank you. Um, you were a wonderful domain expert. And, <laughs> thank you so um, much. Even though this was just a short example, I already learned a lot about this domain. So I learned that there are several systems involved. There's a ticketing system. There are other external systems that um, the system communicates with. We have um, domain terms like PNR and service and report. And um, there's still some manual judgment going on. So um, there's, there's invoicing. So there's a lot of stuff involved that Albert can, can start to understand. And I guess the next step would be, for example, to look at the a scenario where we don't have a leisure traveler, where we have a business traveler, and I guess the process would look differently then. And maybe you can also look at some error scenarios later, like for example, what if um, there's no suitable uh, services that we can provide, or um, what if the leisure traveler changes his or her mind and the number of passengers changes. So that's something we would typically like, uh, took a look at a bit later. Okay, so now that you've seen how it works, it's time to explain you the method. And for that, I will switch back to my slides. Actually, um, no, you know what? I will, I will stay, um, I will stay with this here and just uh, explain the, the method um, using this picture. So the first thing I'm going to explain is this pictographic language that uh, we've been using. So in domain storytelling, we distinguish um, several kinds of, of icons. We have um, actors, for example, a leisure traveler, the travel agent, but also IT systems like the online ticketing system. They are the active parts of the story. They do something, they are active, hence the actors. And then we have the passive parts. We call them work objects. For example, we have, um, we have a report here or an invoice. Um, so those are the things, the information that we work with and the, um, that are created. And we use icons um, to make the picture a little bit more tangible. So whenever possible, we use an, an icon that actually adds meaning to the story. So the icons are not just there to make it look more beautiful, they should actually convey some meaning. So typically um, we try to express the medium, like here it's a conversation and step one and five and six, or it's like um, either a document or a form in, st in step seven, or it's an email here in the second part of step 12. And you will also notice that the story evolves around the actors. That's why the actors are there only once, like the travel agent and the leisure traveler, but the work objects, they can appear several times. For example, the PNR here, we have it here, it's just a piece of information, and we have it here in the form of an email. So that's very useful if you, for example, want to show how a piece of information changes, uh, changes its representation during the course of a process. So imagine at home, the leisure traveler prints out the email and then has a printout of the PNR and uses it to check in at the airport. Then um, it would have changed from a piece of information in a computer to an email to a piece of paper. And that's something you can easily express with that method. Um, then of course we have the arrows. Um, those are our activities. So the things that, um, the actions that uh, the actors do, like pay something or check something or recommend something. And I hope you noticed that um, during the whole conversation, I really tried to listen to Mariam and get the, the terms that she uses in the domain, um, trying not to invent my own terms, not my technical terms. So it's not like create, read, update. If you, <laughs> if you have to do with databases every day, it's easy to say, ah, okay, here's just something created, updated, um, deleted really try to, to um, uh, listen to the, to the domain experts here. And the final ingredient in our language is um, annotations. So I can have annotations either here directly at a step 
or can have them um, at the top of the, of the story if they concern the whole story. So that's our pictographic language. And with that language, we can build sentences. Sentences like um, the travel agent checks available prices and uh, services in the online ticketing system. So the idea is that a sentence in the pictographic language reads pretty much like a natural language sentence in your language. Now that's individual languages, uh, sentences, but to tell a story, we need several sentences. So what we do is we append them and that's when the little numbers here come into play. So we just number the, um, the activities so we can extend the sequence. And um, this is very different from, from other uh, business process modeling approaches where you model, for example, from left to right along a timeline or from top to bottom. Here, you cannot really see the, the sequence um, by, by reading it from left to right. So that's why it's really useful um, either to have a feature like this to step through, or if you show something, this diagram, talk them through. Yeah, this diagram is useful as an aid to memory when you were at the workshop, but if you give it, just give it to someone who wasn't at this workshop with us, uh, it's hard for them to read. So really make it a storytelling. So retell the story to them. Okay. Um, so now we can tell our stories. And I think now it's time to switch back to our slides because there's something that um, I cannot show you in this, in this little example here because it's not part of the language. And maybe you've noticed it. So give me a quick okay if you are seeing the slides again. Yes, it's okay. Okay. So the thing that is missing in domain storytelling are gateways, cases, ifs, switches, however you want to call them. So those little decision points that um, are usually present in activity diagrams in BPNN or, or um, other um, workflow languages. That's um, deliberate decision to leave them out of the notation because we don't want to deal with abstract processes in, in this methodology. Um, rather, we want to deal with concrete examples. So instead of showing all the possible paths that could happen, we first want to look at a couple of good examples of what is actually happening. Because in my experience, um, when you talk with domain experts, they usually start to think in, in edge cases. Um, so they tell you, well, um, a number of things could go wrong. Maybe the external systems are offline. Um, maybe while we were talking, someone else booked that service that you wanted to book and then it's not available anymore. Or maybe just the flight was booked or just one, the return flight was booked by someone else and then you have to change one little um, thing in the whole, from the whole package that you want to order. And so from, from one um, case, you go to the next case and then you spend an hour, two hours discussing what could possibly happen without having understood a concrete case of what actually happens. So of course, in soft development, sooner or later, you need to arrive at these points where you write software that can actually deal with all those conditions. And um, that's perfectly okay. But what we want to do here is we, would, we want to learn from a couple of good examples before we jump to premature and therefore bad abstractions. First, make it concrete, tangible, verifiable. Um, the diagram that we just um, drew together, the domain story, that's easy to verify by a domain expert. If something is wrong, they can point with their finger at it and say, no, there's something missing between step five and six or uh, this, uh, this arrow here at um, step seven, that should be the other way around. That's much easier in, in um, such a domain storytelling workshop than if you just present them, um, let's say a UML diagram. So first um, have a couple of good examples and then build your abstractions upon it. What are such examples? Typically we start with the happy path. Um, we start or then we look at important variations. So the business traveler versus the Leisure Traveler, that's a, a good second case. Um, another case um, that we 
want to look at is probably a error case that happens all the time, or maybe there's an error case that doesn't happen that often, but if it happens, it's really bad because you lose all your booking data or whatever. So these are the cases that uh, we want to look at. And usually a handful, three, four, five variations of a complex business process are enough to get a sound understanding and then move on in um, building your system. Now, um, if we had used a whiteboard, I would have chosen a layout like here, um, where um, on the main, uh, the main surface area I draw, and then I leave a little uh, space to the side for preconditions, assumptions, and triggers. So that's where on the top of the story in this little tool that I used. So I said, okay, this is the happy path. Um, this is a leisure traveler. They are at the desk in the office. So that concerns the whole story. And then on the individual steps, we make these little annotations, either directly at the steps or in the in a, um, area on the side, where we write down a couple of um, variations. Maybe some steps are optional or some steps are only necessary if you're traveling with children, something like that. And I collect those, uh, those ideas when someone presents them to me and then say, okay, that's interesting. So family, I will write it down. What if they are traveling with children? And then we go back to our scenario and finish our story. And once the story is finished, I revisit the list of annotations and say, ah, here we said, what if um, some passengers, some packs are actually children? How does it change the process? And then people usually say something like, well, then we need an additional step here or we can leave out another step. So the, the difference is very little. And sometimes you have a case where they say, oh, the process would look completely different. And what we do then is we just draw another domain story. So that's how we deal with variations. That's how we find good examples and then um, continue with our, with our project. Another thing that I should mention is the topic of scope. So what do I mean by scope? The one factor that is easy to understand is the level of detail that we choose for the main story. Uh, also call it granularity frequently. So um, this example here is from, well, it's a, a fictitious example from um, a cinema um, where you can um, make reservations and buy tickets for, for movies. So the left one, this is a very high level view, a big picture. So you have a moviegoer and in the first step, he or she buys a ticket from the cashier. It's very coarse grained. And then the second step is you buy snacks, you show your ticket in the entrance, ticket is checked, and then you watch the movie, which is started by a protectionist. That's basically in five or six steps, the whole uh, movie experience from a moviegoer's view. But of course we can dig deeper. So the first step, the moviegoer buys tickets from the cashier, we can actually tell a whole domain story, possibly even several about buying a ticket. So that's what we see on the right side. So now we have a process here with much more detail where you choose a seat and there's a seating plan and there's money that you need to pay and then finally you get your ticket. So you see the different levels of granularity. The first one is on, on a very uh, high level. That's perfect, for example, if you have no idea about a domain. You don't even know what they're doing. Currently, I'm working for a company, for example, they produce machines uh, for, for um, steel manufacturing. I have no idea how that works. That's how they um, got me on board and um, helped me to get into that domain. And now we're at a much more fine-grained level and we can talk about the details. So this is what I mean with scope. But level of detail is just one of the, of the scopes. Um, another factor would be, um, are we looking at the process as it currently is, the as is process, or are we looking at a process how we want it to be? Are we designing a new process? So we can do both with the main storytelling. And another factor would be, do you want to actually show the existing systems, how they are used? Um, or, or do you want to leave them out? If you look into uh, in, in, in detail at the right one, you don't see any systems here. So that's an idealized version. Um, that's usually what we, what we do if we find that um, the business experts actually um, 
have lost their own domain language because they were forced to use very bad software systems and are not able anymore to, to talk in a clear business language. Then we say, okay, imagine you would go back to pen and paper. How would you do the process then? And then they find their language again. So that's a little trick. Um, the story that we just did together in the demo, I would say from level of detail, it's somewhere between those two. It's definitely not as high level as the left one, maybe not as detailed as, as the other one. It includes at least some of the existing um, IT systems and it's an as is process, so as it currently is. So the example that I did with Mariam, that would, for, that would be perfect um, still for getting to know the domain, but also for talking about problems. So if I want to do problem analysis, what goes wrong, where are your pain points, where can we improve? I would probably choose a scope like we did in this, um, in this short demo. Now, the picture is just one half of domain storytelling. The other half is it's a workshop format. That's probably even the, the, the more important thing, even though they are closely connected. So it's a workshop format and you can use it in a situation like um, Mariam and I did in a one-on-one -on -one interview, it works. But typically we have a whole group of domain experts with us and we want that group to be diverse and really working at the frontier. So they really have to know how it is out there. We don't put any proxies or, or people who know from hearsay how things work. You really want the experts there. So we often have um, people from different departments, um, from, from IT and from the business side talking together, um, analyzing why, uh, why the, the processes are bad, um, um, analyzing requirements for new systems and having these conversations, they're very important. And actually the conversation, that's almost half of the, of the gain uh, that you will have. The picture is just there to help you along and to have something uh, as a document later on, but having the conversation is really important. And you will see that if you miss important people in this conversation, um, the results will not be as good. So we want this whole group of people there. And what we want to avoid is something that um, I think was done a lot in the past, probably is still done a lot today, where we have a requirements engineer here with um, pen and paper and a domain expert here, the lady with the green hat, um, have like this one-on-one -on -one interview and the requirements engineer um, asks questions from a catalog and she writes everything down in the protocol and the, the domain expert here, she will do her best to answer the questions to the best of her knowledge and be nice and cooperative because that's what she's supposed to do. And then three weeks, four weeks, six weeks later, she gets a big Word document and here, please read it and sign it off. And that's how it traditionally worked. And for me, that's an anti-pattern because the um, poor domain expert has no, um, has no means to influence the, the mental model of the, of the, um, of the business, or business analyst or requirements engineer. So she gives information and then the magically the information turns into some sort of requirement specification. And then you get this big piece of paper and need to read it. And it's pretty late for giving feedback. So instead, we want this um, whole conversation about requirements and business processes and needs to be a vivid conversation on eye level. Um, so again, you saw how I tried to use the phrases and the words, the, the um, terms that Mariam used. I um, really want to learn this language so we can talk on eye level about this. And that's, that's really important. And if you're into DDD, well, of course, this language then later also goes on to be your ubiquitous language, forming bounded contexts and actually ending up in the code. For that process to work, it is really, really important that you visualize the story, not just orally by telling it, you have to visualize it because and everyone um, has to see the picture either in a room on a whiteboard or like we do with Zoom or some online tool and everyone has to see the picture. 
because only that gives the domain expert the chance to give immediate feedback. Like, no, this is wrong. Um, six and seven need to be changed. The order is wrong. Um, or we had an interesting example once where everyone was talking about ship, 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 and they used the same icon everywhere. It was in a shipping domain, uh, but ca cargo ship domain. And um, since I used the same icon everywhere, people started to notice that this doesn't make sense. And then for them, it was clear, but for other people, it was not clear that they used the term ship in different meanings. So we started to distinguish it with different icons and then became clear uh, where there was a big misunderstanding. So that was really helpful there. So these are the kinds of, of uh, things that are possible when you visualize the story while uh, it is happening. And you can do that like on a whiteboard with sticky notes. Um, we actually manufactured a whiteboard kit, um, but I, I guess um, in this day and age, we will stick to digital tools, either with smart boards, or you can basically use Troyo O or Visio or Glyphy or whatever, but it's, to be honest, a bit cumbersome. Even if you make your own templates and stencils, it's still a bit cumbersome to use. Um, so the tool that I used, uh, we had to build it ourselves. Um, based on some BPNN software and it's open source and you can use and download it on GitHub. I will send you the slides later. So all the links will be in the slides so you don't have to write anything down now. So just try that out if you like. Um, for the techies here, the files are saved in the JSON format. So there's really not much of a, of a lock in here. It's just a human readable JSON and you can also export it as PNG or SVG. Okay, so much for the pictographic language, the scope and the workshop format. And now I've prepared a couple of real world examples. How are we doing time wise? Yes, I prepared three different examples. So um, maybe I can present all three of them and then there should still be enough time for Q and A. So as I said before, um, there are different use cases for, for domain storytelling, designing new processes, um, analyzing problems, um, um, working with requirements. So some of those use cases um, motivated, us to, motivated us to use domain storytelling in these projects. So the first one is um, a software that we built to coordinate road work. And what happened was a couple of years ago, the city of Hamburg um, contacted us. Um, we knew each other from, from previous projects and they said, well, um, we have this problem here. Um, there are a lot of traffic jams and construction sites are a real problem. They're causing traffic jams. And we think that um, we could improve the situation if we had better coordination of the construction sites of this road work. So that was the whole idea start early to coordinate the construction efforts. So then in the years later to come, you have um, less impact on the traffic. So we said, but they said, well, can you build some software for that? And we said, well, we are sure we can build some software for that. Um, the only problem is we have no idea about road work and coordination and, and construction. So what is going on here? So what we did is we had a series of workshops with domain experts. And before we started even domain storytelling, we did some old fashioned UML use case diagrams. Why? Because um, they said, well, we think the problem is in coordination. So we asked them for all of the use cases. Those are the bubbles in case you're not familiar with, um, with the uh, use case diagram notation. And then we added all the, the stakeholders or actors that are active in one of those use cases. And then we just looked at, okay, which use cases involve a lot of people. So here on the right side, you see a little uh, zoom into this use case diagram. And in the end, we picked, I think it was five different um, use cases where there were a lot of people involved and analyzed them for coordination. And one of them was this coordination round, it's called, or coordination meeting. And that we picked, invited the people involved and um, in the very same uh, workshop day, we uh, started to draw some domain stories. So and that's one of them. We did it with a different tool, doesn't matter. 
it's also in German, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to understand the, the process. So this is about a meeting, hence the group of people here. And they have one very important work object that's called a coordination list from Excel and print it out and send this email, first Excel, then email, then print it out and do a lot of things with it. And when they told us this process and, and we said, well, it's, it must be very cumbersome working with this long, long list of construction sites. And it would be really cool to see such a meeting and participate. When is the next meeting? And um, maybe can we observe it? And they said, okay, the next time there's such a meeting, you are invited. And then we attended the meeting. And since we had this domain story before, we knew why, why they were having this meeting, um, how the meeting was prepared, what was expected, and also the work objects they used. For example, here on the right, you see this actual printed out coordination list and you see a person with a ruler going through the list with the ruler because there are so many lines on it. Um, if you don't have a ruler, this eight, you will lose the line and then um, you cannot talk about it. And on the screen here in front, you see a map. So this is how this meeting um, was going on. And domain storytelling here really helped us to identify which meetings to attend and um, interpret what was going on in that meeting. So then came a very creative process um, where we started with um, paper-based mockups because we said, hey, obviously there's a big problem in uh, handling these big lists and also the maps. So somehow we have to bring together this time aspect and the geographical aspect. And we started to um, um, bounce around ideas and, and um, had some conversations with our domain experts, like maybe a digital version of it uh, of that uh, meeting could look like that. So everyone has a tablet or computer and you see where you are in your list and have a common view on the same thing. And the next step was to actually design a process around that vision. So on the left, you see the old one, the original process. And on the right, you see a sketch or an idea how it would look like. And here you see that actually the format of the software changed. It's now a touch table. Um, and that gave us the chance to come up with a viable process. Okay, if we had the software, how would you work with it? How would a meeting like that work? And basically then all the errors here later became um, user stories or requirements for the table. And again, we got feedback from that uh, and refined the process. And then finally said, okay, um, can you build a prototype? And we did, and this is uh, the prototype. And this whole process um, took us four months from um, from the first meeting to a workable prototype with real map data and real project data. So it's not just a click dummy, it's actual working software, just with a very small um, functionality, but enough to put it on this device, on this touch table, have people placed around it and um, try to have such a meeting. And um, it worked, so it became a real project and now it's actually a product running in several cities. And it all started with a couple of um, domain stories. So you see that was a process where we used it to analyze the situation, come up with new, better software supported business processes, get feedback on them. And also it served as a anchor point for this whole um, UI and UX design. The second example is much less shiny or flashy um, because it's about um, an insurance. It's about a company pension uh, scheme. So um, you, can, you have your, your personal pension either from the, from the government, from the state, or maybe you have an individual personal pension that pay you yourself. But some companies also um, offer uh, company pensions where part of your salary goes into that fund. And then uh, when you retire, you get basically your piggy bank full of money um, sponsored by your employer. So this is a, a company that provides such services um, to, to other companies. And um, their problem was and still is, they have this big standard software that they customized a lot um, to make this work because it was actually built for a different kind of um, um, insurance. So they kind of um, customized it very heavily. Actually, some million lines of code were customized in this in the system. 
And now they've arrived at a point where they said, okay, this cannot go on forever. We need to find some slices that we can take out, carve out of this standard application and develop it um, as, as new software, um, as um, individual software, as opposed to the um, off-the-shelf software. So the task here was find those slices, find slices where you can really say, okay, this part of functionality that's in DDD terms a bounded context. So we were looking for bounded contexts, or actually for subdomains that then became, um, could become bounded context. And um, interestingly, we used a mix of domain storytelling and event storming here. And I know the graphics are not very good. That's on purpose, actually, even though it's an, an, an anonymous uh, um, picture, but still, um, well, it, it doesn't really matter what's, what's in there. You see there's a lot of things going on on the left picture with an insurance, uh, pension insurance and a company and some money and documents are changing hands. And the left picture shows how we did it originally in the workshop. And then we started to have discussions like which of these activities do belong together, which um, are very closely related, which are not so closely related. And that's when we started to rearrange the layout a little bit so that the things that are, have to do with each other are closely related. And that's when we switched to the, to the right uh, graphic here. And then we started to draw boxes around the parts that belong together. And those are actually our candidates for bounded context. So we have something like registration or benefits payment or framework contracting. So those became the candidates for the bounded context. But there were some um, parts of, the, of this domain um, where domain storytelling didn't seem right as a methodology, um, especially the parts that evolved about the, around the life cycle of, of an insurance contract. And for that, we chose event storming, um, analog and also digital later on. And basically we did the same thing here so in the end, we had two inputs for our context diagram, which is the bottom one. So some things we identified in, in the domain stories, some things we identified in the event storming, some things we had in both, actually. That's a good sign because um, then it's, it's, a, it's a better heuristic. And then we extracted it and tried to build our, um, our context map from that. So that's another use case um, for domain storytelling. So analyze a domain, uh, trying to find subdomains, bound a context, slice it up. And the third and final example is from a colleague of mine um, at an airport. Um, they did several projects there. Um, the one that uh, I'm talking about is um, improving the way that um, passengers get from the gate to the runway where the planes are. Um, in many airports, there are these, um, how are they called? These bridges, they're called bridges, yeah, where you walk into the, into the plane. Um, but in this particular case, they actually have a lot of buses that drive um, people to the, to the planes. And it's quite a cumbersome process, actually. Um, so that's a part of the SIS process, driving passengers from, from gate to the runway. And actually what they did is, they did an SIS analysis, where are the big pain points? And they identified three parts in this process. And especially the large red circle below involving the bus driver, it's all German, sorry, involving the bus driver, um, that was problematic um, because it involved a lot of manual work still writing things on paper and handing in paper reports that later get digitalized and very ever prone and slow. And so they started a project and said, okay, let's make a project and digital, digitalize this part of the process. So again, they used domain storytelling to come up with a better IT supported process with an app um, for the bus drivers. Um, so the whole disposition process can be um, scheduled much better. This is again, something that they did together with the domain experts, so the software developers and domain experts together. And um, for every step in this process, let me go back, that involves the, the bus app that you see in the middle here, 
um, for every step, they started to draw mockups, again, paper-based, um, to visualize the information that would be needed to carry out that step or the result of that step. So they kind of transformed the, the, the main story into kind of a user journey with the help of the mockups. And that together enabled them to fill the backlog um, for the project to get it approved later on. So they had still very coarse grained, but um, very well validated um, user stories. Uh, this is just a glimpse at the backlog, not the whole of course. Um, so they had an idea like what's the context, what's the process uh, looking like, which steps need to be supported. And also they had the, the mockups, so they had an idea what to build. And that gave them the, the possibility to fill the backlog, to prioritize it, and also to, to estimate the priority and also the effort it would take to build it. And that's um, how they used it for planning the new process and also the, the project. Okay, I've been talking for quite a long time now, but still um, there's more, of course, to it. Um, I'm not able to tell you everything I could tell you about domain storytelling, but um, Henning, my colleague that you saw on one of the slides and I have been writing a book about it. Um, so far we've, writing, we've been writing it on LeanPub. Um, I'm not sure if you know LeanPub, but it uh, gives you the possibility to write something, publish it, and then add to the book and publish a new version. So it's really a iterative and incremental platform. Right now the book is like 80% done and um, if you download it from LeanPub, you will get notified every time we publish a new version. And I guess this is the best time now to actually give you a voucher um, because as far as I know, LeanPub works in Iran, but to use LeanPub, um, you need to pay for the book with a PayPal account and that doesn't really work in Iran, right? So we said, okay, um, we will just give you the book for free so I will post a voucher code into the chat in a minute or two. And you can use that code to just um, download a copy um, uh, and, and yeah, read it and give us feedback on it. It would be really cool. As I said, it's still in progress. And um, actually the next version, I guess will be published end of by the end of this month. Uh, finally, we, finally, we are um, going to publish the chapter "Working with Requirements," my favorite chapter. So, yeah, um, go ahead and enjoy. And then this is the final slide, just a collection of links. I will publish this um, this uh, slide deck on on speaker deck, and I guess. Um, the, the meetup organizers can maybe post a link to it later in the in the meetup um, page that you use, and then you can access the slides. Um, and there's basically everything you um, you need to know. And yeah, I guess um, that's it from me. And now I'm really curious for your questions. I see there's a lot of things going on in the chat. So maybe well I'll uh, well I post the uh, link in the in the chat. Can you maybe take over and uh, have a look at the at the chat and the questions and moderate that? Uh, yeah, there was uh, only one question. It was about okay. the tool that you used, mm -hmm. uh, but you already uh, answered this question. Um, personally, I had two questions for you. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was, when do you tell yourself that, yeah, now it's the time to, to use uh, domain storytelling? When do, you, when do you start it and when do you repeat it? Yeah. So I'm posting the link to the Lean Pop book right now. And now I'm able to talk again because I'm really bad at doing two things at once. Um, so of course it depends a little on the situation that you're in. Um, I can answer by giving another example. Um, so we did a project uh, a while ago where um, our customer gave us a requirements specification document. 
400 pages full of requirements. Not very HL, but they are a government um, um, institution, so they had to do it that way. It was mandatory. And they had a lot of use cases they wanted us to build, but very little on the processes. So we said, okay, we know like this, this whole bag of use cases, but how are they all interconnected? How do they play together? So that's when we as developers said, okay, please, um, Let's spend uh, two or three hours and tell us your most important business processes. And then we understood, okay, these are the problems. Ah, and that's why this feature is so important for them because they have really a bad situation right now. And that helped us to understand everything and put everything in context. And this, this understanding lasted for, let's say, two or three months. And we said, okay, we, in the meantime, we started to build software. And then we said, okay, now we really would like to understand how you envision your, your future work, press, uh, work process. So the to be process. So again, we had a workshop and they said, okay, um, we want to use this new software like this and that, and then this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And um, again, that helped us until we reached a point um, where they said, okay, so we want to ship the first part of the, of the software into production because the, the whole backlog was, or the specification was actually prioritized in two um, deployments. So the first deployment and then the second deployment. And they said, well, we have a strange feeling. Something is not, not working out here. So maybe let's look again at more detail at what the software can actually do now. And then we discovered that there was actually a slip up um, in their priorities because some features that they, they needed in, in the first uh, delivery were planned for the second. And with domain storage heading, we could show them, hey, there's, there's a hole in there in the process. You know, you, you're reaching a dead end and the feature that kind of goes to the next step, well, you plan, you plan that for the next three months to come. So they rearranged the priorities and um, in the end it worked out. So that's a typical example where um, we used it over and over again. So not just in the beginning of a project to get familiar with a domain, but also repeatedly whenever we had a problem with the processes, either with the currently are or like they, are, um, uh, like they should be. So that's um, a typical example um, of that, yeah. And now I've always seen another question and maybe that kind of ties in together with, with your question, like when to use it. Um, the when second do you one use... is about event storming. Yeah, exactly, when do you use event storming? So in the beginning, as I said, um, this whole collaborative modeling, well, it's like a toolbox and we have several tools in it. So there's domain storytelling, event storming, user story mapping, you can even count example mapping and a couple of other tools in this toolbox. And it's always good to have more than just one tool because you know the saying, if everything, uh, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But what if you actually don't have a nail, you have a screw or maybe something you need to glue together? Well, you would better be off with a different tool. Um, so often with the situation where you could actually use both. And if you're familiar with event storming and are happy with it and the results um, are great, okay, then there's probably no reason to switch. But then again, there are situations, um, I gave one example where we use both in the same project. That happens quite frequently now. And then it's interesting to know which tool to pick when. So for example, whenever I want to really understand collaboration, how people work together, how people and systems work together, how they exchange information, that's much better in my experience to capture with the main storytelling because you see the actors and how they interact with each other. In event storming, you have a timeline. And that means that you see what is happening but you know, the, 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 the stick is for the actors. If you even use them, they are much smaller and you have the same actor, the, the travel agent here and there and there and there. And it is travel agent, customer, travel agent, customer. And okay, so they're exchanging information, but it's still based or arranged all on a timeline. 
So sometimes when we run into that during, um, during event stopping, we say, hey, this segment here, this is highly cooperative. Let's look at this part of the event stream and um, let's try another perspective and model it again, maybe in more detail with domain storytelling. And then the perspective changes away from time towards cooperation. So that gives you another, um, another perspective as well. We also had combinations where we did it the other way around, where we started with a big picture domain storytelling. And then uh, when it was a bit more technical and more towards implementing a domain model, um, people said, um, um, well, can we do this with, with um, event storming now and do like this um, design level, implementation level event storming, and that also works. So it's always good to have an, an option and my first criteria for, for picking domain storytelling is always, is it a very cooperative process? Um, yes, then it looks like domain storytelling is probably the best choice. And actually now with a couple of, of clients that I have um, that we've both used both methods, usually they themselves say, hey, can we do an event storming on this or can we do a domain storytelling on that? Because they understand pretty pretty quickly which method is, is best for which situation. Thank so you. Did that answer the question? Mm, we hope so. Um, Sebastian can uh, solve the question. Um, there is a second question from mm -hmm. Ibrahim. Uh, he asked if um, domain storytelling is more classified in knowledge crunching methods mm -hmm. or more in design approach? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, I guess it's both. So it's definitely a knowledge crunching method. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the term, but it appears in, in DDD several times. So really transfer domain knowledge from the domain experts into the into everyone involved in the software development project. So in the developers, in the UX uh, designers, in, um, in the testers heads and the business analysts heads. So yes, um, that of course, because it, it really gets this conversation going. You really have in-depth conversations um, about stuff. Um, I frequently see this kind of moments of revelation between the domain experts themselves people from different departments come together in the same room and say, ah, finally, I understand um, why we are doing this because they usually have just, you know, they, they just know their little part of the whole process. And once you get them together and say, okay, your department, their department, you're exchanging all these documents all the time. What, what purpose does it have? Then they begin to understand. So knowledge crunching, definitely. When you say design approach, um, design in the sense of process design. That's actually another, uh, another um, reason for me that I, in some cases I prefer domain storytelling to event storming. Um, every time when it's, a, when it's not about analyzing a situation, but when it's about designing a business process together with domain experts, I usually tend towards domain storytelling because it has worked better for me than the process design level of, of event storming. Um, that's maybe then a second step, but I'll, I like it better to work out the scenario and the story with domain storytelling because I have the feeling that um, people, especially the main experts are more on board. And once you figure that out, you can take that and go a level uh, deeper with, with event storming. Um, so in that sense, it's a design approach. Yes, um, it's not a design approach when you think about design as UX design. There's a connection there. I showed one in the examples where you can say, okay, this is the story that we want to build and now we will make mockups for the several steps, but it's not a real like, um, it's not an approach that says, um, you have to include mockups or something. Um, it's just a possibility to connect different things. So for example, um, what we did is we had uh, um, 
domain story uh, that gave us the context. And then we said, okay, these three steps here, we need to implement them. Um, um, let's have a design studio, if you know that technique, and then this domain story and the steps there, they are the input for the design studio. And then the whole team um, designs mockups for the interaction of these um, steps in, in question. Thank you. Um, okay, what personally I, f I found powerful in domain storytelling is that it's easier to, to understand as we can also replay things and it's much more faster than, than, than even storming. That was my, my first um, view of, of the things. Uh, so, so I have another question. So do you invite the same people in a domain storytelling session that uh, you invite in a store in an event storming or it's different people? Yeah, no, it's actually the same people you would invite uh, to a big picture event storming. So that's, okay. that's the same target group. Yes. And um, yeah, it can be, different, well, if you use event storming on this implementation level, where you really design your aggregates and everything, then you usually just deal with, uh, with developers or the development team, and not so much anymore with the, um, with the domain experts. So then it's a different group, but if you compare domain storytelling and event storming on the, on the big picture level, and maybe even on the process design level, then it's the same group of people, yeah. So we have uh, another question from mm -hmm. Sebastian. Uh, he asked, uh, does it happen that a domain storytelling reveals problems in business process? How do you manage this situation? Yeah, <laughs> it, it happens. There's a um, funny story. It's, it happened a long time ago, so I can, I can tell it. I'm not going to name names, but it was the, the best one. It, it didn't happen to me, but to my colleague and my boss. Um, and, but the story is so good, I, I, I wish they had been there. So the story goes as follows. Um, again, it's in the, in the logistics domain, and we are talking about a logistics warehouse, um, a big, big yard with lots of containers and boxes where, where stuff gets uh, shipped. And um, out there on the yard, um, there are guys that, uh, the guys that work there, they look like that because they all need to do heavy lifting and, um, it must be quite funny to have people like uh, that in a, in a domain storytelling workshop because it's usually not the, the, the kind of people that are used to uh, office work. But um, so that's, that's funny that um, it worked even with, with them, though they are used to physical work and not to office work. And um, that was pretty much the first time they were together with the people from the I think in English it's also called disposition um, department. So that department that knows, okay, this train is coming at that time and this truck is coming at that time. Oh no, that, that container that was, go, uh, that was um, is ready to pick up, but the truck is still in a traffic jam and we need to delay it. So they imagine, manage um, everything like that. And what they did is um, they sent... Uh, the disposition guys, they sent faxes. So back then there was still paper and faxes to a fax machine inside a little office. It was in, in a container. Um, it was actually their, their breakfast room for the guys who did the heavy lifting. And in the corner of this breakfast room was um, a little fax machine. And then the fax arrived and said, um, this, this truck from, from the logistics company so-and-so will be three hours late and uh, you need to delay the the picking up of that container and so on. So that's, that's how they got the updates. So we, not we, but my, my colleagues and they, they were in the, in the same room and uh, talking about this process, trying to improve it. And when it came with faxes, uh, faxes the, the um, guys who did the heavy lifting, they said, ah, yeah, yeah, the, those piles of paper, we always throw them away. Well, you do what? So that uh, was, apparently quite a um, difficult situation because emotions um, kind of uh, came into play. So it turned out that um, 
none of the hard work of the disposition guys where they put all the information like which train is coming early, which truck is coming late, where they put all that into faxes and put it in the fax machine and send it there. It was all for nothing. Why was it all for nothing? Because they didn't realize that the guys who were supposed to read the, their faxes, they're actually out there in the rain or the, the uh, steamingly hot sun all day um, doing the hard work. And they only have a break like every three hours. And then they come into this little office. And what you do then is they drink their coffee, they eat their sandwiches, and they don't want to be bothered by, by uh, notifications that, um, that are three hours old. Because when it says, well, the truck will be two hours late, well, it already arrived by the time I read the facts, right? So they said, okay, it's not worth going through a pile of, of outdated information they just threw in the trash as it was and deal with it on their own way. So um, that's a typical case uh, of what happens when people who just make assumptions, um, who are not really talking directly together, when they actually are in the same room talking together. And that was probably the, the, the best example that, um, or the most vivid example. And then, um, a skill comes into play that is not probably not natural to software developers, and those are moderation skills. Um, because you really have to try and take out the emotion of everything. So I've had workshops where people were actually shouting at each other. It was about a report, and uh, one person said, oh, why are you making such a big deal of this? It's just a stupid report my report is not stupid. Okay, and then it's, it's tough for a software developer who kind of grew into this role to, um, to actually moderate the situation. Um, but the best tip that I have is try to get people back to the story. And that's where really the story from it helps um, because it's tangible, it's, it's um, vivid, and um, when you say, okay, we only have one hour left, we need to finish the story, don't leave, leave here with a cliffhanger, um, then people try to calm down and, and um, uh, yeah, to try to, to finish the goal together. So the story is something that they usually can, can agree on. So uh, there are some books on, on moderation techniques that um, I found helpful. Um, so that would be a recommendation. Um, yes, my advice would be back to the story. That's always very helpful. And sometimes it's helpful if two people just cannot agree on how a process works. To say, okay, so there's Mr. Miller and Ms. Smith, and one says it's this way, the other one says, no, it's that way. So which one tells the truth, right? So what we do then is um, we make the stories even more concrete. So we don't say this is the travel agency. So we say this is not the travel agent. This is Mr. Miller, the travel agent. And then Mr. Miller tests the process from his side. And then we have um, Ms. Smith and she tests the process from her side and we draw a separate picture for that. And usually what happens when we um, put these pictures next to each other is they are not so much different. Maybe they're different in a few little details, but usually this whole argument like, no, you're doing it all wrong it boils down to just a few differences and that's something again you can work with. So that's another um, trick that I sometimes use. But I have to say I'm, I'm lucky most of the time it works uh, rather well. Um, yeah, but it, it, it can happen, yeah. Thank you. It was a long answer to a short question, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, very well. Um, uh, personally, I have a last question. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is uh, more general than domain storytelling. How do you avoid business experts to go, um, to go a lot in details? You know, when you let expert, um, business experts, people talk, mm -hmm. they, they talk, they talk, they talk, and you can't stop them. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how do you manage this situation? Mm -hmm. um. Well, it's always good to beforehand um, agree on the purpose of the session. For the demo, actually, we didn't do that because it's just a demo. But usually in a real-world situation, you have certain 
um, questions that you want answers uh, to. So, so you know, um, are we doing this so we learn about the domain because we've never worked in this domain before? Are we doing this to analyze where our current IT software, IT solutions or software solutions are not good enough? Um, are we trying to design a new process around this new off-the-shelf software? What is the goal? So we first um, talk about that. And then as a moderator, I know, okay, which, which scope? So I talked about scope, like what level of detail and so on. And um, once that is settled, I know which level of detail to aim for. And then I try to keep it a consistent level of detail. So for example, let's again take the, the process we modeled together. If for some reason, Mariam would have told me about, well, and then about the payment process. Um, I have to put in the card, uh, the credit card into the, into the terminal and then the pin, and then maybe the pin is wrong and so on and so on and so on. I would say, okay, this is far too detailed, much more in much more detail than the rest of the story. Let's try to keep it on the same level of detail. So that's one trick um, to, to do that. Um, Another trick is of course, again, to say, okay, let's go back to the story um, because usually you have a limited amount of time, right? Um, everyone is busy these days, so you can't afford to just um, um, extend a two hour meeting into a four hour meeting or a six hour meeting, it doesn't work that way. So what I try to do then is if I know time is, is, an, is an issue here, I say, we have one common goal um, for this workshop. We have two hours time and this process that we want to look at, I want to look at it from beginning to end. And if that means um, we have to leave out some detail, I would rather have a more coarse grain process, but at least I know how it begins all the way to how it ends, as opposed to we start the story and then in the middle it stops because we're out of time. So that's the, the time boxing trick that I use. And if time permits, you can always go lower or on a lower level. Um, but if, if you're seeing the time becomes an issue, I would rather say, okay, um, let's stay on a course screen level. And the last trick is um, often people do that because they seldom have the chance to be heard. So finally, someone is listening to them. Finally, they can tell either how busy they are, maybe how great they are or what problems they have. And that can lead people to actually sharing more information that is, is necessary and kind of losing sight of the goal. So again, I try to, to value that. So I say, okay, I'll make a quick note of that and we will have a look at it later. And now please let's go back to the story. So you see, it's always the same couple of tricks that I use. Um, so I try not to shut people up and say, that's enough and let's just ignore that. I try to write it down and um, then I say, but before we deal with, with that information that you just gave me, let's finish the story. And then in the end, the last 10 minutes, we will revisit it. And um, if we then decide that we need to have a look at it, we'll schedule another uh, meeting uh, rather than getting distracted by that information. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Uh, apparently, we don't have any more questions. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, our, view, our participants learned something, that they, and that they enjoyed it. Personally, I really loved your, um, your demo. I will try to uh, use it in a real world project to, to see what happens. Uh, I would like to thank you again, uh, Stefan, um, giving your uh, time to us. Uh, I would like to thank Mariam, uh, Masoud and Ibrahim that help us to organize this event and uh, perfect. Have a cool. good night. Uh, Au revoir, <laughs> And uh, bon appétit. If, if you didn't and, and enjoy eat your it. weekend, everyone. Yeah, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.
Goodbye. It was a pleasure talking to you. All the best to you. Khoda Hafiz. You too, Khoda Hafiz. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, and thanks again, Sefer. It was an honor to be with you all, and goodbye. Thank you, Mary, and bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.